Hey y'all, I wanna spend some time today talking about how to create a keyword opportunity model for a potential acquisition. Now, if you've never created a keyword opportunity model before, it's essentially just what it sounds like. It is a representation of the total addressable market in SEO, all of the keywords you wanna go after, what pages those are mapping to, and what relative volume you can expect to get from ranking in those positions on those different keywords. So paired with all of the financial models that your corporate development team and your finance team are coming up with, with a potential acquisition, you can create a lot of different confidence or opportunity scenarios for the potential acquisition and the potential timeframes to get to those different scenarios over time. Now, ideally you're creating a bunch of different scenarios for a potential acquisition, like what does volume look like? What does revenue look like? when you are ranking in the average position two, three, four, five, six, whatever, across all of these different categories and topics that you're going after, and then mapping that to different input roadmaps as well. So what is it going to take in order for you to get to that average number two, number three position? What's it going to get uh, for you to achieve the bottom page one position or whatever your scenarios are. So I'm going to hop into my screen here and give y'all my template that I use for opportunity modeling and then just show you some of the ways that I think about how to get from that initial keyword research to, okay, this is our content roadmap. This is how much volume we can expect from these different keyword categories and how that informs the investment thesis and due diligence process for a potential acquisition. So let me just hop in and we'll get right into it. So I just have here an example, a few example keywords in my keyword opportunity model template. And really I just want to kind of give y'all a little tour of essentially what all of this is and how to use it. So right off the bat, we're really starting, like I said, with trying to get at what is the total addressable market for this keyword set that you're going after. And in this case, we're just looking at the credit cards niche. So uh, in column A here, we have our keywords, obviously, uh, which is going to be part of any keyword opportunity map. If whether or not the keyword is the main target that you're going after for that specific page. This is important because we are rolling up all of this keyword research into this pages tab here, uh, which is essentially just a query function off of the keywords tab. This query function, if you've never used it before, basically turns your Google spreadsheet tab into a queryable SQL database essentially. So you can do your typical select from where notation to get at a rolled up version of whatever data that you are grabbing. So I think in some cases, it can be a cleaner kind of style pivot table if you still want like this spreadsheet format here because you can sum up different values. I can see I'm summing up the monthly search volume, averaging the keyword difficulty here, and then bringing in a bunch of different dimensions from the keyword tab. Anyways, we'll get to this one a little bit more in a second. Monthly search volume, you can get this from Ahrefs, SEMrush, whatever tool that you use to do keyword research, the keyword difficulty, which can be different depending on the tool that you're looking at, just use whatever you prefer. And then I'm mapping each of these keywords to a specific landing page that I want to create or for a site that I'm looking at, they have already created. Essentially, you're just doing all of your keyword grouping and keyword bucketing at the landing page level. So you can use tools like Keyword Insights here as well to help you speed up that process, or you can just manually bucket all of this stuff into individual landing pages. The Keyword Insights tool in particular uses essentially SERP matching to understand how many common results are on page one across this set of keywords and uses that to bucket terms, which can be really effective for speeding up this process. And then for me, this is really personal preference depending on how granular you want to get and how many different cuts of your keywords that you would like. I like to get really granular because I upload a lot of this stuff to rank tracking software that allows me to get at different dimensions of my entire total addressable market or keyword set and really identify different trends across different characteristics of keywords. 
So I have a bunch that I typically include in my keyword opportunity model. It's going to change a little bit depending on the category. I might have a few custom ones for certain topics. But you can see here just things like parent topic, subtopic, the content group for that specific keyword or specific page that it's mapped to, the page intent, so what stage of the buying journey is the person who's landing on that page in, whether or not it's a branded or non-branded keyword or an owned keyword, which would be your own brand name or the brand name of the site that you are looking to purchase. If they have a lot of branded search volume, that's obviously a great thing because those are keywords that your competitors generally cannot touch and I think is a really good trust signal as well. Entity, so this one is really just what is the brand, if there is an entity or, or brand that's mentioned within the query, which can be effective for just having that as a keyword tag or group in whatever rank tracking software they use. Keyword intent, I like to separate this out from page intent because oftentimes you're going to have some keywords in your keyword opportunity model that have more ambiguous intent. And what I mean by that is that there are several page types that are ranking on page one. So in your initial opportunity model, you may say, oh, I need to create a roundup to go after this term credit cards, as an example. Six months down the road, 12 months down the road, Google may change their mind and have a bunch of different types of pages, let's say informational pages and not roundups on that query. Your page intent did not change, but the keyword intent changed. So there's really not much you can do in terms of small tweaks and edits to your roundup in order to optimize for that keyword. You essentially have to go after it with a different type of page. So separating out that page intent from the keyword intent, I think is really important just for identifying some of those disparate cases where those two things don't necessarily match up one to one and all 10 results on page one are the same page type or the majority of results on page one are the same page type and that changing over time. Query class, so I really like this dimension because I find it really useful to identify longer term trends in terms of how Google is potentially interpreting different ways to phrase a query. So across different page sets, across different keyword sets, you can have common query classes that essentially I think gives you some pretty granular insights when you're doing rank analysis on which results are moving and shaking and how Google is interpreting a lot of those different query classes. And if there's one that you're really skyrocketing on or plummeting on, that can be a really easy way to identify a potential smoking gun for those changes. Quantity, um, so best credit card versus best credit cards. Uh, again, just another dimension that I like to use. You don't have to use it necessarily. And then I have a few around whether or not the keyword has the parent topic, has a best review or year qualifier, if it's a question, if it has pricing information, if it's geo-modified, if this is a critical keyword for the business. So I like to separate out like, hey, if there's only 100 keywords that we went on, these are those top 100 or top 75 or whatever the number is. I find those to be really impactful for more higher level reports and likely pages that you're going to want to update or touch more often. Whether or not you're tracking that, this is more of an administrative dimension here of just have you uploaded that keyword into your rank tracking software yet. Whether or not the page is published, which is a lookup off of the inventory tab here. So I'll show you all that in a second. Rank tracking tags, so this is just a concatenation of all of these dimensions. So oftentimes in whatever rank tracking software that you're using, you can bulk upload these via a semicolon or comma separated CSV file. And so uh, oftentimes that's just really easy to just copy and paste this into whatever rank tracking tool that you're using. And from here on out, this is really where we get all of our funnel data. Um, so I am pumping in Google Search Console data. Once I populate that in there, it's obviously all zeros now with this dummy data. 
what the max position is for that keyword based on our assumptions, which I'll get to in a second. Current and max click-through rate. So you can see a trend here of having what are, where are we at right now and what's the max that we can get to. And calculating the difference there is going to give you, hey, here is the remaining opportunity on this keyword, on this group of keywords, on this page to really help you understand, hey, are we at 50% of max opportunity, 60%, 70%? whatever else, and help you prioritize a lot better. Current traffic and max traffic, revenue per visit, or however you calculate efficiency um, for monetization on each keyword or page. And then just some sum ups of revenue and traffic and the incrementality of those. So you can imagine when you pivot this out or when you roll this up on the pages level here, it's really, really easy to see which pages have the highest remaining incremental revenue, highest remaining incremental traffic, or however you want to prioritize your content roadmap. So, like I said, all of this stuff is just querying into this pages tab. You can see all of these different dimensions. And then here you can sort by any of these columns and really down, get down to the meat and potatoes of what you want to prioritize. So how do we come up with all of these different metrics around position and click-through rate? Now this is going to be different for everybody, depending on how granular that you want to get and what you want to cut your keyword opportunity model by. And what I mean by that is everybody has different parent topics that you're going after, content types, your click-through rate curves are likely going to be a little bit different, RPV is going to be different depending on the page type, and what you consider to be a average max position in one category is going to be different from another category. So I found this to be a generally decent approach for getting to a ballpark of these different opportunity models. No opportunity model is going to be 100% perfect no matter how granular you get because click-through rate <clears throat> is always going to be very, very different depending on the SERP features that are around you. Obviously, each page is going to have very different behavior in terms of RPV, but bucketing all of this stuff can help you get to, okay, here's how to prioritize all of this information. So all of this funnel data pumps off of this assumptions, assumptions tab. So we have a few things going on in our assumptions tab here. One is click-through rate assumptions. So I have click-through rate assumptions, just baseline for top 10, that uh, is pretty typical with what you would see on any sort of click-through rate curve model that a lot of third-party tools have. And then I have breakouts for those different click-through rate curves by different combinations of brand versus non-brand and the intent of the keyword. So you can see brand ambiguous intent has a very different click-through rate curve than the baseline. Answer intent, very different click-through rate curve. Consideration intent, very different click-through rate curve, and so on and so forth. And you can see these branded results are very different than non-branded results because for a branded query like Chase Credit Cards, as an example, Chase.com is probably going to occupy a much larger share of clicks than a non-branded review site or informational site lower down in the SERP versus if somebody searches for best travel credit cards, that click-through rate curve is going to be a lot flatter and clicks are going to be spread more across the entirety of page one. So you want to account for that in your click-through rate models or else all of these branded terms uh, are going to be a huge part of your total addressable market uh, because you know maybe max position for those you say is the number two spot and instead of applying something like a click the rate right around here you're applying more of a click the rate whoops there we go right around here so anyways good to have Click the rate assumptions there, separated out by those different intents in brand versus non-brand. Also have RPV assumptions in here. So this again is going to be totally subjective based on your business model, but I like to separate this out by parent topic and by intent. So 
For parent topic, this could be things uh, like in the credit card space, travel credit cards versus secured credit cards, which operate at two very different ends of the credit band and are going to have very different levels of monetization. Credit card issuers are typically more bullish on giving higher payouts for your premium credit cards, you know, stuff like a Capital One Venture card or a Chase Sapphire Preferred card. Payouts that are three, four hundred dollars for some credit card affiliates in that space is not unheard of. That's going to be very different than something like a you know store brand credit card or a student Capital One Journey credit card or something like that that is going to be a less lucrative customer for the brand and they'll likely have a lower payout for those cards and all else things being equal around conversion, things like that, obviously that's going to change too. Our PV is going to be very different. So make sure to map that for whatever categories or niches that you're going after for different parent topics and intents. Obviously the intent is going to change the RPV assumption as well because conversion is going to be way worse on stuff that is just like a straight answer query. Like uh, what is a good credit score, right? That's going to be very different than like best cashback credit cards, uh, which is more in the consideration or, or transactional buckets. And then I also have page level overrides because with any business, there's always going to be exceptions and you want to make sure that you can, in your opportunity model, account for some of those exceptions. So if there are specific pages that are outliers that you need to account for, throw those page names in here with specific RPVs and the model will account for that and insert those specific RPVs in place of the other assumptions for those specific pages. And then average position is the last major bucket of assumptions here and this is going to differ by parent topic and intent type again you could go super deep on like which competitors are impassable which ones are passable based on the site that you're analyzing and get super super granular on the individual keyword level that's a great way to approach opportunity modeling not knocking it at all i've done it plenty of times before i think this approach is 90% less work and gets you to a decent outcome where you can actually get all of these different forecasted scenarios. So you can look at, oh man, what do we need to do first off from an inputs plan? And then what does the business case look like for getting to the average seven position, six position, five position, etc. for all of these different keyword buckets? which paired with a lot of the financial data that your corporate development team, your finance team compiles, can give you some really interesting scenario modeling for just long-term opportunity on the business. So you can approach it this way, you can go super granular with individual competitors and kind of creating who are the, the ones that are completely impassable, who are the ones that you could realistically pass in three, six, 12, 24 months, whatever. But I think there, you know, there's merits to both approaches. Do whatever you like. This is really what I, uh, I found is a fairly efficient method to get to a decent outcome. So adjust your assumptions and all of that stuff will funnel into your keywords tab and then your rolled up pages tab here. I mentioned pulling in current traffic, current click-through rate, and current position as well. That is all coming in from the GSC data tab here. So this is essentially just an export of the Google Search Console data for whatever site that you're analyzing. If you don't have access yet to Google Search Console, maybe it's early in the diligence process or you haven't signed an LOI yet and the seller is a little uncomfortable giving you access, you can just download the Ahrefs Organic Keywords Report or SEMrush Organic Keywords Report, whatever you use, and pull that in here as well to get where are they ranking currently and where does max position look like. And then a couple other tabs here. So one of the calculated columns in here is whether or not this page is published. Uh, so you want to understand how many pages do 
they currently have for the topics that you have mapped to this total addressable market analysis? And then how many pages are they have yet to create? Uh, and you need to go and put some editorial muscle behind them and go out and create those pages. That looks up off of the inventory tab. So this is basically just page name, URL, date published. Super simple. You could go more complex in here and build out your own editorial inventory. I actually typically have a separate document for my editorial inventory where I have a lot of different dimensions and it's more of a working document with the editorial team in order to track progress on your content roadmap. So you could import that in here if you'd like. Really, this is totally up to you, but it's really just meant to be a lookup table for what keywords do you, uh, and what pages do you currently have URLs for and which you don't. This is my content roadmap template. So uh, this is a summary tab of the editorial inventory, but I have things like topic, what's the status of the page. So I'll include my net new keyword research in here as well and just have it in the backlog. And then the editorial team can change it to outlining assigned, et cetera. Things like parent topic, subtopic, page type, buying intent, author, target keywords, traffic potential, monthly search volume, keyword difficulty, all this good stuff. Again, rank tracking tags, doesn't need a refresh, all that good stuff. And then what that does is just rolls up into the editorial summary where you can get a detailed view by parent topic or category or whatever dimensions that you wanna look at it by. How many articles do you have in published status and all of these different stages of the content production cycle. How many refreshes do you need in each of those categories? Again, just going off that last column checkbox here. And then getting some efficiency metrics on pages published per week, 12 week rolling average, last four week trend, and then 12 week rolling average and last four week trend for refreshes as well. So good little summary view there. But anyways, this is separate from a keyword opportunity model, but you can use whatever you'd like to track editorial inventory. Anything as simple as these three columns here or anything as complex as this content roadmap template or really anything else that you wanna use. But it's just important to have it in there to be able to map what's currently published and what's not. And then lastly is the change log here. So I think it's important with any sort of large documents like this to have a change log around assumptions uh, that you've changed and how that has changed the model, any sort of major additions that you've made, edits that you've made to the formulas, things like that, just to keep everybody on the team, especially with uh, if you have a ton of cooks in the kitchen, a lot of hands in the document, that uh, everybody's on the same page around what edits have been made. So. With this document, you can, like I said, create those different keyword opportunity scenarios and essentially get to what is your inputs roadmap for all of those different scenarios of getting to different levels of that total addressable market. Pair that up with the monetization data that your corporate development team and your finance team has been developing and essentially start to forecast what the business can look like post acquisition and what are the other inputs or opportunities that you've spotted from your due diligence to say, oh man, if we overhaul all of, this, all of these content opportunities that I've identified during due diligence, or we really improve our link velocity to catch up to competitors, or whatever the inputs are, you can start to create these different scenarios and make sure to create downside scenarios as well. If rankings fall, what does that do to the business? So having those different sensitivities can really give you a great complete picture of what the business could look like in the future post acquisition, depending on all of these different factors. So let me know if y'all have any questions and I will see you in the next video.